Welcome back to United in Action, Dialogues at Siji Center. I'm your host, Steve Chu, and I'm delighted to see you here. Each year on June 20th, the Office for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees celebrates and observes World Refugee Day. Now more than ever, with the Ukrainian crisis exceeding over 100 days of conflict, it is critical for us to reflect on how we can come together as a global community to protect the dignity of those on the move and help them rebuild in a resilient manner. In this episode, we're going to explore some of the emergent challenges and solutions from organizations and entities working on the ground in countries like Poland, Moldova, and Romania, where millions of refugees have been fleeing to. In order to address a crisis of this scale, Siji truly believes that collaboration is key. So we're super happy to share that we've been partnering with local agencies on the ground that are working hand in hand with those who have been displaced. Now let's watch a video together to learn more about Siji's partnerships. Over three months since the Russian-Ukrainian war erupted on February 24th, more than 6.6 .6 million Ukrainians have fled their homes. Tsuchi USA volunteers visited international organizations' aid operations in Poland, Moldova, and Romania for a detailed look at their work. UNICEF is very, very grateful for the financial support and the partnership from Tsuchi Foundation. The partnership is around provision of services to children and families, very much looking to protection of children. They then signed several memorandum of agreements to leverage international forces to help displaced Ukrainians on a broader scale. Dzięki współpracy z fundacją będziemy mogli realizować fantastyczny projekt pomocy osobom, które przybyły do nas z Ukrainy. Jestem przede wszystkim niezwykle wzruszona tą ceremonią, dlatego że od pierwszych dni jestem z ludźmi, którzy uciekali przed wojną i głos mój został wysłuchany. Prosiłam Boga, pomóż mi. Okazało się, że jest bardzo wielu ludzi dobrej woli, dobrych ludzi, którzy chcą pomóc. Cieszę się, że nie jestem sama. It started with three people having a coffee the day after the war started and said, we have to do something. So he started making meals and took it to the border. And within a week, this entire place was filled up. What Siji can do is work with our partners to assign one point of contact who can be in this hub to collect the right items to deliver it to the urgent need area. I've seen Tucci teams in multiple crises. I know the capacity, the professionalism, the dedication, the compassion, and the network. Tucci is one of the most effective organization distributing aid. Israel signed a partnership with Tucci for two years. Rice is another area we can support, mm -hmm. but the most important is the long-term recovery directions. People? People? It might. Working no. together. Joining us online, we now have Deborah Boudreau, the CEO of Buddhist Siji Foundation USA. She's just returned from her second trip to Poland, Moldova, and Romania. So nice to have you with us today, Deborah. Nice to see you, Steve, and hello, everyone. So happy you're with us to share your wisdom and experience coming from back on the ground to here with us in digital space. I'd love for you to share with us how Tsiji has been responding to the Ukrainian crisis and some of the stories of the refugees that you've been hearing on the ground. Yeah, um, this two trips is very interesting. Each trip has different mission but always carrying one goal the goal of looking to Tsuji position as a civil society faith-based organization international ngo what can we do during this kind of um so-called uh, man-made disasters so Tsuji coming from various locations in poland from uh to Poznan to Lublin and Warsaw, we see the volunteers put into effort to provide disaster relief, went into uh, various shelters and also provide um, food package and also emergency shoes, clothing. Finally, we identify our niche as a financial assistance. 
through the various disaster relief, we saw a lot of women carry their youngest to across the border. When we see their face, we can feel like and identify their frustration, their helpless, hopeless, and also do not know where would be their so-called temporary homes. We see the children, some of them by themselves, walking across Medica border, the crossing point. We saw children sitting on the bench, do not know where is their parents. We saw the first responders has been trying their efforts to provide emergency food, drink, water to help them on the way to a non-eternity city. Those reflections always come to our mind and, my, and our thoughts. What as a faith-based organization we can provide the services to them. After a long journey, we visit various locations. We went into different crossing points, no matter in Poland, in Romania, in Moldova. These very clear situations, the current challenges is no ending time. By unknown futures, everyone need to face the reality, what I can do at this moment. How can I put my life back to so-called normal? So that's what we see. Tsuji provide the financial assistance. Let them go to supermarket to purchase some basic needs. Let them go to department store to pick up some clothing and shoes. Let them have a capacity to have someone like Kamenian, like Red Cross, like our local partners to give them a little bit supports, not only temporarily housing place, but a place can be a temporary so-called home. So when we have chance to visit UNICEF Brood Dot Centers, no matter in Medica or Polanka, we can see child protections is so important. We can feel social protections is so important. We also see children lost when they hear a big noisy. Looks like somebody is trying to attack them. So that kind of anxiety and panic faces continue reflect in our journey. So how to work with the children through various curriculum planning to identify this kind of post-trauma disorder symptoms through various mechanisms to help them will be our key directions. Thanks so much, Deborah. I think as you lift it up, a lot of the work that we're doing is in direct service. And as we're doing this direct service, we're encountering those that are suffering directly. And beyond what we're doing in the immediate physical sense, we're also providing that sense of hope. 
right? You spoke to so much of the trauma, suffering, and pain, and all of these local partners that we're working together with on the ground that are working not just to give them what they need, which is that physical, right? But that spiritual level of like, not just the shelter, but a home, right? Not just the goods, but that sense of safety. To heal a child, not just from their sense of loss and trauma, but so that when they encounter big noises, they don't feel that fear that comes from all of this PTSD of the war. So I, I'd love to now jump into our second question for you, which is you spoke a little bit about like the Camillans, the Red Cross. I'd love to hear a little more about these nine MOUs that we've signed with local partners over the process of working in the Ukrainian crisis. Can you share with us a little bit about the importance of partnership to Tsiji? Each partners that we collaborate has various functions. For example, UNICEF, we focus for children and women, especially for children. Children, child protection, we saw this kind of child trafficking, human trafficking situation did happen around the border. So for UNICEF, we focus for child protection, social protections, and also resourcing establishment. For Israel, when the disaster strike, they already moved into Moldova in Romania. So for Israel, our project will be so-called long-term recovery. Those long-term recovery projects will be more focused for job skill setting, children's art, music, and climate education. For Kamenian's project, we went to Central Station in Wasa. We saw the emergency needs by providing hot food and information resources, transportation, and information. And for Polish Woman Foundation, this is so critical at this part. When we see the woman bring the children across the borders, we feel some of the woman has been under a lot of trauma. This trauma can be coming from mentally, and some of them are physically abused. So Polish Woman Foundation provide a safety place for those women can have a place to receiving medical care. We work with uh, Airlink by providing transportation, the humanitarian hub, by working with our partners like Adventist Development and Relief Agencies, ADRA, and Project of Hope, and World Hope International to provide medical supplies. At this moment, there's a huge medical supply shortage. We also work with Caritas and International Red Cross in Lublin, in Bosnian, in Krakow, of course, Warsaw by provide emergency weekly food package. The most important now we are looking at Doctor Without Borders because medical care really in a huge needs. The post PTSD, post trauma situation, social cycle recovery will be a long process. This kind of long process really need medical professional to be able to provide the services. WHO, various global healthcare organization are trying their very best to provide the services. We will continue to working side by side. That's the team works and capacity networking. 
that we are establishing right now.、Mm, that's beautiful, Debra. Thanks for painting such a comprehensive picture of all of these different partnerships that Sigi's been embarking on, and we can really see how they're all flowing deeply together in synergies. Right? We're not just providing the immediate assistance, but we're having an eye on the long term of like job skills training. We're not just taking care of their immediate medical supply gaps, but really setting up these long-lasting partnerships that allow us to continue this as As the crisis continues as well, and whether it's from financial assistance all the way out to really cultivating a sense of、uh, hope through continuous support through food security, we know that Siji and its partners are really there for the long haul through this systematic approach. So I'd love to now turn it back to thinking about community and individuals, recognizing that this refugee crisis isn't just one that is far removed from us in a, a country far away from us, but rather this. Has impacts on all of us within our、uh, communities. I'd love to hear what your thoughts on how individuals and communities can help these refugees as they're coming into our country or they're continuing to move across Europe. That's a very good、uh, questions for nonprofit organization and civil society to look into it. So we would like to invite everyone continue to demonstrate your support. By doing donation, and if you have limited resources for your financial contributions, you can help us to raise the awareness by sharing that Ciji and our partners are still on the ground to provide the services to the vulnerable. So you are welcome to visit. Our website, our social media, and look into our Facebooks to get the most updated information and share the awareness for Blue and White Angel and our partners. What is our footprint? The other thing is, please talk to your medical professional if they have surplus. New medical equipment or one-time usage medical supplies. Please consider to encourage them to look into our website. Now, more and more Ukraine moving through various locations in new countries. They may be in Germany, in UK. Some of them may come to United States. If there has a space for additional family to stay, consider to host the Ukrainians. And if you are small business operation or large private partners corporation, please consider to offer Ukrainian a job, a place they have their own dignity to make their own. Meaningful life. No matter you are in UK, in Poland, in Moldova or Romania, the humanitarian volunteerism need people twenty four seven. So a lot of methods, directions are there. It all depends on every one of us. How we want to make our life more meaningful. So many people are suffering right now. The Ukrainian, even the local Poland residents, are facing challenge too. Sometimes a simple encouragement, positive energy message. You can bring a big smile in those family members' face. Donated your supports, no matter its financial capacity, no matter its personal professionalism, or a simple kindness, love message, will be a big bamboo bank. This kind of encouragement 
can be saving as a merit to bring the people into a big compassionately circle, the circle of care, the circle of love. Think positive, leave no one behind. Mm. That's a beautiful message. Thanks so much, Deborah, for really coming together at so many different angles to share how we can give, right? It's not just about giving financially. Everyone has something precious that they're able to share to those who are facing this suffering. And to live a meaningful life is to give of ourselves in service to those in our community. No matter if we are working directly on this refugee crisis or we're working on another global issue that is of concern to ourselves, so long as we give into our community, we can create these virtuous cycles of love and really ensure that the world that we are creating together with each other is one that is accepting, loving, compassionate, and is able to address the needs that are rapidly changing every single day. We are really finding ourselves in this challenging moment and together, Tsuji and its partners are working hand in hand to ensure that we are allowing for refugees and migrants coming out of this Ukrainian crisis to become more resilient and maintain their dignity. Now let's watch together a video from one of our partners at UNICEF and how they are working to help support refugees and protect their rights of women and children. Hello everyone, this is Enrique from UNICEF. I'm reporting from the Moldova-Ukraine border at the town of Palanca, where UNICEF has set up a Blue Dot. The Blue Dot provides services such as psychosocial support for the families that are coming from Ukraine. There are social workers, there are psychologists. It also provides child-friendly spaces for the children who come uh, to be able to play and rest and have a, a minimum of normality uh, in, their, in their current struggle. Sunt parents care spun spate să vă cuprind. Spate să da mulțumesc mult pentru acordul care ne l-ați dat, ajutor. Pentru că acești părinți este important doar să stai să-l asculți. Unii părinți sunt care, da? Depinde iarăși de categorii. Să înțelegem că nu toți vin aici, vin cei care au nevoie. Andrea Vrancianu and I'm the coordinator of Katia, the center for uh, receiving refugees, Ukrainian refugees here located in Brasov and also a blue dot. Most of the time we are inclined to tell that the children's experience it's not that impactful like in the adults because they don't see reality with the same eyes that we see but actually they are the ones most hurt by these kind of changes. They are actually suffering deep down inside and you can see them as they cross into the place because the place is big. It's not that warm, cozy space in the beginning. You can see them that they are surprised and amazed about, okay, this is a very big place, what will happen here? And in the morning they wake up, they have breakfast and after this they discovered the playroom and there is where the magic happens because all the kids start to know each other and start to play one with the other and in one or two hours you have already races over here and you see them running all over the place and actually the change is striking and it's happening in like this in an in a glimpse only because they have access to a place and to a community that makes them a little bit feel like home. Children speaking the same language and a safe space where they can play, that's something that makes a very, very big difference.
We're now joined by Andres Kragelung, the Deputy Director of the Emergency Coordination Team for Global Programs at UNICEF USA. On April 22nd, Siji signed an MOU with UNICEF USA to support UNICEF's work in emergency response, helping children and families impacted by the Ukrainian crisis and conflict. So together, we're going to be exploring some of UNICEF's work alongside with how we as individuals can take action. Andres, so good to have you with us today. Thank you for having me today. Mm, we're so happy to have your perspectives as we really explore and dive into how UNICEF has been working through this entire crisis. And I know it's a really busy time for you guys, so I'm super grateful you're with us. Can you share with our audience a little bit about how UNICEF has been responding to the crisis overall? Sure. So UNICEF has been in Ukraine even prior to the war. Uh, UNICEF's presence in Ukraine has been there for 25 years, including the last eight years throughout the protracted conflict, especially in the eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, but since the start of the war in February, uh, we've really increased our supply uh, provision. Uh, 150 tr trucks of supplies have been uh, brought in, uh, our service provision as well. And that's across different sectors. Uh, for example, in the last three months uh, since the start of the war, uh, we've provided 2.1 million children and caregivers um, access to primary health care. Uh, we've also reached uh, about 620,000 uh, children and caregivers with psychosocial support, another 2.1 million people with access to safe water, and lastly, about 62,000 uh, households with uh, multi-purpose cash transfers. Uh, so it's really a combination of not just the supplies needed to do that, but the services to ensure that uh, children and families are able to survive and thrive not only in Ukraine, but also in the neighboring countries as we've seen so many refugees have fled from Ukraine in the last three months. Yeah, so I know UNICEF has really been working to scale up this work and it's been doing so in a profound way to allow us to impact and touch more lives, right? From the 2.1 million uh, women, children and families who have been able to access primary health care, these stories that are happening on the ground, I'd love for you to share with us some of these stories and then also specifically how UNICEF's Blue Dot Hub program is really helping these children children and families on the move. Of course. Um, one story that really comes to mind is from a colleague that was just recently in Romania. Uh, there has been many stories that we've seen in media reports and also from UNICEF colleagues, but this one kind of uh, really uh, focuses on the work that needs to be done for children. And that was a center in Romania that was not only taking in Romanian children with intellectual disabilities, but when the war started, they also started bringing in children from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges, as you may know, with differing languages is that children are not able to really fully communicate. So uh, there were a lot of different um, activities uh, to get to integrate the children while they were both living in the center. Um, so one of the activities as we led up to Easter uh, was um, just paintings and drawings uh, and really a way for children from each country to uh, invite each other, to wish each other something ahead of uh, the holiday. Yeah. Um, so it was a great story, and but it also had these wishes that the children would give to each other. One of them that was really impactful was uh, one of the Ukrainian children uh, wished the Romanian kids uh, for them to have a quiet sky. Mm. So that in itself, it shows you not just the physical impact that this war is having on, on children, but something that we already knew is the psychological scars that it's leaving behind. Mm -hmm. um, and the ways that UNICEF is addressing this is through the West. You mentioned the Blue Dot Centers. Um, there's Blue Dot Centers across neighboring countries. And in those Blue Dot Centers, we not only have a uh, one-stop shop for health checkups, um, connecting folks to um, social services in countries, but also addressing the psychosocial needs that children have. Uh, for example, there'll be child-friendly spaces where children can draw and express themselves and kind of be a child. Yeah. Uh, there's also an area where they could work with psychosocial specialists to really uh, process the trauma they're going through because this is an acute child protection crisis. So we need to address the child holistically, not just the physical needs that they have, but also the psychological ones that they have. Right. And I think you're, you're so on point in that, like, there's this invisible pain, this invisible suffering that everyone is feeling as they're fleeing. And the Blue Dot centers are really this great mechanism to ensure that as women and children are moving across their migration path, that they're being taken care of and getting access to these resources. So I'd love to come back on this idea of like holisticness, right? And I know part of the way that UNICEF is approaching this is by signing MOUs with these different organizations like TG. And so mm -hmm. with ours that we signed with you, we really focus 
focused on both child protection and social protection. And so I'd love for you to continue to this conversation and expand with us why these two key areas are so important in order to ensure that refugees and migrants are resilient as they continue on their journey to leave the crisis. Um, yes, uh, honestly, Sushi's foundation ha uh, support has been critical. Uh, and in April, um, UNICEF released a renewed appeal with new funding requirements for the remaining of the year. Uh, it was about 949 million in terms of needs. Uh, and Sushi's foundation support really came at a critical time because the two biggest areas of support were child protection and social protection. Mm -hmm. And these systems are really crucial, as you mentioned, um, in a holistic way because about two thirds of the uh, children in Ukraine are displaced both internally and abroad. Mm -hmm. um, so having systems that allow you to um, reach children, as I mentioned, the Blue Dot Centers outside of Ukraine, but also in Ukraine, uh, we have mobile teams of child protection specialists that could go into areas where there's not as much access, uh, for example, in eastern Ukraine, and really go in there whenever they're able to and provide psychosocial support in quick interventions that support children, mm -hmm. have uh, hotlines for children to be able to uh, call into and have support. The social systems are also key because um, the cash transfers that are received through the social protection system um, help with positive coping mechanisms. Right. Uh, as we know, um, when you become displaced, you're more vulnerable to risks such as gender-based violence, sexual exploitation, and and, um, and just having that cash support is crucial to be able to cope with the, the movement into other countries or even internally where there's a lot of displaced children uh, in Ukraine. Yeah, and I think that, that sense of lost of hope Right, like these programs of child protection, social protection, it's about restoring that hope, yeah. right? And I'm so grateful that together we get to be doing this work in a way that supports these refugee children, women, families on the move. And so coming back to our audience, I'd love to explore with you final thoughts, call outs, how can individuals and communities really help this global crisis, right? It can seem so yeah. far away, but there's gotta be something that we here in our own lives can do to help this work. Absolutely. And it does seem sometimes far away, but it, at some other points, it really isn't. Um, there are more children that are displaced than ever before right now. Uh, just to give you some uh, stats, uh, last year, 82 million people were uh, forcibly displaced. 42% yeah. of those were children. Yeah. Um, and that was already enough of a big number. But we already received uh, information this year that 100 million people in this oh. year alone have been forcibly displaced, which is the uh, largest figure to date. Um, so as we're getting closer to World Refugee Day, I think it's important to recognize that just similar to the pandemic, this is a global challenge and it requires a global solution. Mm -hmm. um, so similar to there being uh, refugees in Ukraine, um, there's going to be refugees due to climate, due to um, different conflicts around the world. And collectively, we can get together and support these uh, displacement across the world. It's a global issue rather than specific to one country. So we're thankful uh, for having supporters like the Sushi Foundation and really any other supporters at any level. Uh, UNICEF uh, operates solely in voluntary uh, contributions. So at any level from the public sector, private sector, anybody that we could receive support from, we're really quite gracious. Yeah, definitely. And I think in thinking about what this means for our future, right? How we respond in this moment, the systems and partnerships that we're able to build right now allow us to pivot, adapt to the different displacement problems that may emerge in the future, right? Absolutely. We've previously talked about climate change on this uh, series before, and we recognize that this is also a growing problem, right? And it's only by coming together as a whole of society that we can actually be able to address this global challenge together. Absolutely, I couldn't yeah. agree more. Definitely. So thanks so much, Andre, for really sharing with us all this great work that UNICEF is doing. Global challenges truly do require global solutions. And I'm so happy that you've been able to not only share with us the work, but give us a sense of hope that in this moment of crisis, there are good people doing good work on the ground to help those who are vulnerable and in need. And so with that, we're super happy that you've been able to join us for this episode. We're going to be continuing this conversation, reflecting on what we can do as a whole of society to help these refugees coming out of this crisis in our next episode. Continue to build on hope, continuing to build on what actions we can take. And we're looking forward to having you join us in that episode as well. Thanks so much for being with us today. Bye-bye. Thank you.